Welcome to this edition of Real World Employment Law, where we discuss real world issues impacting businesses and executives. I'm Declan Leonard. I head up the employment law practice here at Berenswag Leonard. I'm also one of the managing partners. And I'm Seth Berenswag. I'm also one of the managing partners at Berenswag Leonard, and I uh, help run our corporate and transactional practice, and it's uh, great to be here. Seth, I should have called this the new and improved edition of Real World Employment Law. We're right. here in our new broadcast studios here in our office, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Berenswag Leonard, but also BL Media Group. Uh, it's uh, it's pretty impressive being in here. Well, we're really excited about it. Uh, it opened up this week. It is a full broadcast studio, and uh, it is uh, something that our producer, uh, Todd Castleberry, put together. And it really is a, a really exciting platform. And, uh, you know, it's the two of us in here today, but it has uh, much broader capacity as well, so it's really cool. Yeah, I kind of miss uh, Todd not being in here. I, you know, I used to be able to rag on him. Now he's in this uh, fancy production room uh, next door behind the uh, the walls. I know. Well, we can still make fun of him. He's just not in the very same room. Yeah, so. no, this thing was a couple months in the making. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, The lighting in here is unbelievable. I've had this beard for three years now, but it's only <laughs> now showing up in the light here. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's impressive, very impressive. Well, this is really good timing uh, because there's been a lot going on in the world of uh, uh, corporate law and how companies and employers are dealing with COVID and the vaccine mandates and regulations. So I uh, just wanted to just jump us right into that because there's really a lot to cover. We haven't been here for a couple of weeks during the studio construction, but what we'd like to do today is catch everybody up on uh, where things have gone and, and where it's going. So Declan, can you catch everybody up on where we are as it relates to um, all of the major court cases for COVID regulation and as also particularly related to the vaccines? Absolutely. So our last our last couple of podcasts, it seemed it was dominated by the issue of uh, uh, mandatory vaccines, whether it right. was employers with 100 or more employees, whether it was a lot of our client base, which is uh, federal contractors, mm -hmm. um, healthcare workers. Um, and, and we were fielding questions left and right. We were doing these uh, uh, broadcasts uh, uh, on this issue. And a lot has happened, obviously, because those issues have really sort of gone away for various reasons. Now, when we went off the air for a short break, it was right before the uh, cases were bubbling their way up through both the federal appellate courts and to the United States Supreme Court. That one related specifically to 100 plus employee companies with respect to the vaccine um, mandate. So uh, can you break it down in terms of the private employer vaccine mandate and also for the federal government contractor requirement? Yeah, so the, uh, the, the private employer 100 employee uh, uh, vaccination mandate is no more. Um, that made its way up to the United States Supreme Court. United States Supreme Court said uh, that's not going to fly. Um, and eventually OSHA has pulled that. OSHA is the Occupational right. Safety uh, and Health Administration. And that, that's the federal agency that, that, that was implementing and enforcing this. And, and, and that's gone away. So there is no mandate there. And mm -hmm. with respect to the federal contractors, that one actually has not made its way up to. So that one applies to all federal contractors. Doesn't matter what size. Mm -hmm. um, that one is now currently uh, uh, sort of stayed, and well, not sort of, it is stayed, right. stayed and on appeal at one of the lower appellate courts. So it's not at the U.S. Supreme Court yet. Uh, arguments are not set in that one until April. And candidly, I mean, that's, that's just going to go by the wayside, but from a timing yeah. perspective. So I think that what's happened from a broad picture perspective, and let's kind of take a step back, I, I think that we really need to recognize how how often and, and how frequently companies and management have been whipsawed through this whole thing. Because it was a it was a hurry up and implement. It was a, if, if you are a mid to large um, uh, commercial employer, everybody's got to get vaccinated, absent some very narrow exceptions for the government contractors, regardless of size, everybody's got to get vaccinated uh, with very, very narrow exceptions. And then all of a sudden, all of these cases started ping-ponging around the courts. And it's really been um, something that's been very frustrating and very difficult for companies and executives because it, everybody rushed in. They did what they had to do. If they didn't do it, 
including, for example, in the federal government contract space, then they would be in breach and they would be in trouble with the federal government as they were telling their employees, we're not doing this because it's fun, we're doing it because we are required to do it by the federal government. Now, the federal government's uh, vaccination mandate, as you said, is on hold, it's on stay. It's, it's, it's not coming back anytime within the first half of the year, probably the hearings in April. It's probably then gonna bounce over to the Supreme Court. So really it has created some frustration and some confusion. But at least now we know that there's clarity in terms of the fact that that's not going to be in place in terms of the vaccines. But that's not the case with respect to other aspects of um, hygiene and uh, uh, practices and protocols in the office otherwise. Yeah, right? and, 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 and a lot of that is going to be governed by state law. So here in Virginia, we've got our own agency that deals with this. They say, mm -hmm. listen, when you're indoors in the workplace, you're really supposed to still be wearing masks. Um, right. We see a huge, huge tide uh, of lifting mask mandates. You see that in the schools mm -hmm. uh, uh, yesterday in Loudoun County here in Virginia. Right. Uh, they lifted it. Um, and it, so it does seem like states are going in a direction of lifting those. Right. But as of right now, it is important important for uh, 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 businesses to be mindful that, look, okay, vaccine mandates. By the way, businesses can still voluntarily impose vaccination right. mandates. They can, they may, but they're not required to they're do They're not so. required to. And, right. and, and candidly, I haven't seen many that are that are going down that road right. now that the pressure is off from the actual mandates. Right. Um, and they would still have to have the religious or the uh, medical uh, uh, exception Exemptions. to those if they did right. that. Yep. Um, but but that's exactly right. So, so companies should still be looking looking to, for some of these hygiene things that you were talking about, um, you know, just kind of the stuff that they've been doing. It's not that onerous uh, yeah. uh, in terms of uh, in terms of in the workplace. Um, uh, 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 but I think what we wanted to talk about today was, look, as a result of COVID, employees are all over the place. Uh, employees are located all over the place now. Um, right. And so, so why don't we why don't we why don't we hit that? Sure. So now that we know where companies are on those requirements or, or have been re relaxed from requirements to um, the, the opportunity to apply it if they desire, the reality is that as we're turning the lights back on and the economy is back up and companies are fully back up, because of what happened in transitioning out of the pandemic, we now have a um, essentially a, a hybrid workforce. We have a situation where um, companies are having um, uh, part uh, in office, part out of office time and or remote workplace. So what's happening now is that you have a dispersion of the workforce and therefore companies as we are going through the, uh, the next part of this phase are going to have to address how to manage hybrid and remote workforces. So let's talk a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, I mean company HR departments already had their hands so full uh, uh, even before this trend of of, of workers, uh, uh, employees being dispersed in various states working mm -hmm. for the same company. Right. Um, and so now what, so they always had to worry about, okay, what's going on in my home state of the, the, the you know, the, where the company's located? What are those staying on top of those HR laws and those employment laws that right. change? You know, they tend to change year to year as legislatures uh, 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 come in and, and leave, uh, depending on priorities. Now they have to learn about basically employment laws in states where they have, you know, a, 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 a uh, uh, an employee who might be working remote from an apartment or something, not where they have offices. Right. Um, right. But the way these employment laws are set up, they really say, look, if you got employees that are physically located in a state, states like California, Colorado, they're very much on the progressive side, and so you can imagine there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of regulation, uh, uh, right. uh, very much uh, uh, governing that employee relationship. Now, a lot of companies, let's say that for a typical scenario, we have a, a, an IT Northern Virginia-based government contractor, and let's say that they have uh, people in the workforce that are working remotely in five other states. Yeah. In the employment agreement, it may say, for example, that this employment agreement uh, is going to be governed by um, Virginia law, mm -hmm. and that the the, the uh, dispute resolutions that will occur for any issues that arise under this are going to be addressed by Virginia law in a Virginia court. You're talking about um, a heightened situation with a remote workforce in different states. In that kind of a situation, can the company contract 
state laws of the other five states completely out of the equation, or is that still something in the mix that they need to be mindful of? Yeah, no, they cannot. Uh, uh, they cannot put in an employment agreement. So, for instance, you know, let's just say it's a Virginia headquartered company. Uh, uh, they have an employment agreement that says, "Hey, this is going to be governed by Virginia law, mm-hmm. and all disputes are going to be uh, say in uh, uh, adjudicated County. here in Fairfax right. County or federal court down in Alexandria." Sure. Um, you still want to always have those in your employment agreement, but they're not going to get you out of state specific specific laws. Mm -hmm. So for instance, uh, uh, Colorado is a good example. Uh, They've got laws in Colorado uh, uh, that say you can't ask about somebody's pay history. During the interview process? Yeah. During the the interview process, they don't want to know about salary history um, because they believe that it perpetuates gender discrimination in pay. So Mm -hmm. if you're asking somebody what they made at their last job, well, their last job, they, they would argue, may have discriminated against that person. So they have laws against this. So you've got to, if you're hiring for a Colorado position, even if you're a Virginia company, you've got to be able to make sure that you adhere to all these state laws uh, that come into play. So if I'm interviewing a candidate in, uh, in, in Colorado, in Denver, if I ask them what their uh, salary history is, then I'm, I'm, I'm violating state law yes. from Colorado. And yep. there's no way that I can contract around that. Yeah. I can say that, their head, that the headquarters is based in Virginia. I can have the venue for dispute resolution be in Virginia. But I, can't, but I can't excise myself out of the local requirements. And that's why it's important to be aware of, of, of where these folks are located. You've got to become a mini expert on all these state laws. Colorado is another great example in the hiring right. process because uh, Colorado now says that when you're posting for a job, let's say you've got it on Indeed or you know mm-hmm. one of these online sites, you've got to expressly state what the salary range is in those postings. Um, New York's another one that just recently did this. Okay. Uh, and again, all of these are geared towards, at least the stated position of those, is to geared towards you know trying to eradicate uh, pay disparities among minorities. Okay. Um, so you've got to know that if, you've, if you're hiring in Colorado or if you're even soliciting for, to, to hire somebody and you're doing so in multiple states, including Colorado, you've got to have this salary history in there. So now that we have this new remote workforce and the technology on this is is facilitating it, so you're not going to be able to unring that bell. Um, are there elements of this that companies need to be aware of in terms of impacts beyond just the technical legal provisions that employers need to be aware of in terms of applying to companies operating their business? Well, yeah. I mean, so it, so employment laws, there's so many examples of those. Mm-hmm. But even just beyond employment laws, when you're talking about like companies, like let's just say a company is headquartered in Virginia, they will register with the Virginia State Corporation Commission. It's not right. an onerous requirement, but that's where they'll register. They'll pay their annual registration. You're talking fee. about where they're headquartered. Yeah, where example. they're headquartered. Right. Um, but now what's happening is you've got a remote work work uh, uh, employee that's uh, uh, that, that's in California. Right. Well, is that employee now basically doing business in California such that that company has to register the business? And and, and there's no one size fits all mm-hmm. uh, uh, answer to that. There's a test that comes into play. Different states do it different ways right. as to whether or not having a remote employee in that state ends up being doing business as, you know, so for purposes of all this. But but what you can imagine is these states want you to have to register and pay taxes. Because they make more money. Of course. (laughs) Yeah. They don't want you to be a Virginia headquartered uh, company. (laughs) And yet, you know, you've got people in California, you've got people in Colorado, you've got people all over. So this is another way that it directly impacts. Um, There's just so many things. I mean, we've been working with clients on updating their employee handbooks because it used to be you have an employee handbook for a Virginia company. Okay, mm-hmm. what are the Virginia laws that we have to really worry about here? Um, now you've got to have like state-specific uh, 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 addenda that are attached to each one. You don't want to start throwing California law into the main employee right. handbook. But if you got a dozen employees out in California, you then have to know, i got to give them this state-specific addendum dealing with all of the California laws. I mean, California is probably the leader when it comes to right. these laws. I mean, right. oh, we, we know overtime laws and in, in, in sure. the federal law. Everyone kind of knows you work more than 40 hours, you get yeah. time and a half. California right. says you work more than eight hours in a day. So yeah. forget about 40 hours, you get time and a half above that. And if right. you hit 12 hours, you actually get double pay. So and that that's the tip of the iceberg when it comes to California laws. Uh, coffee breaks, meal breaks, things that are different under California yes. law. There's a lot of different sorts of things. 
This raises an interesting scenario also because if you're a federal government contractor and you're bidding on and, and then aiming to win a new piece of work, mm -hmm. you'll want to think about, of course, where you need to staff that. Not only because you have to start taking the preparations to go ahead and gear up to, to get your FTEs in place, but you need to understand what those requirements are because if you're going to be bidding on that and you want to make sure that you have a, a, an accurate cost capture in your proposal, you need to understand what those expenses are. And, and, and if you don't know how those current laws apply in that area, then you're going to end up um, with a mathematical error and then you may yeah. not be capturing all of your GNA in the contract, which yeah. could be another headache as well. It's hard enough to be able to get some kind of a profit margin on these things. Those run pretty thin as it is. So in other words, it's important to keep regular track of the jurisdictions that you are and may be working in because that way you're going to be able to cover all of those bases. Yeah, the companies that I talk to, my clients, they're excited on the one hand because what, what, what I think COVID... Uh, 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 showed them is that we do not have to limit our hiring mm -hmm. to, you know, let's just say we're here in the DMV. We don't have to limit our hiring to driving distance from headquarters. Right. We can now sort of uh, spread out and look for other talent across the country. So on the one hand, that's like a huge benefit, a huge, a great realization for these companies. But on the other hand, now you've got to, you know, you've got to really, really stay on top. It's very taxing for the HR uh, uh, departments now right. to really, really stay on top of this. Leave laws. I mean, there's another example. So many different states, especially as a result of COVID, but they're going to continue these post-COVID. They've come up with leave laws now. D.C. has one. Mm -hmm. Maryland. Everyone's got their own sort of leave law that you've got to make sure you're complying with. So the, the days of having a sort of a one-size-fits-all PTO <laughs> policy right. is, is, is no more, really. Right. And, and and, and it really begs the question of when's the last time, if you have an employee handbook, and it's not uncommon for companies to have the pieces in the back that incorporate the states that they're in. When's the last time that you had that updated? So completely. Um, so, so I, I know that we bring we need to bring this conversation in for a landing. So let me ask you this final question: We had really the great dispersion. We've had a couple of great things. We've yeah, had yeah, a great, the great resignation, the great resignation and, yes. and and the great dispersion. The, the fundamental matrix and the structure of how the American workforce is deployed today, regardless of whether it's in the federal or commercial sectors, is, of course, fundamentally different than it was two years ago, or, or even perhaps roughly two plus years ago. And now, as we get into the spring and summer months, and as we see different states, whether you call them red states or blue states, they're really starting to indicate that the masks are going to gradually come off, and things are going to start to continue to normalize. And certainly, that's very good. As a resident of Montgomery County, I can tell you the numbers <laughs> have been great. Thank goodness. Yes, yes. The masks are going to come away in a couple of days. The, 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 the per day infections per 100,000 over just a couple of weeks went from over 1,000 to under 100. Oh, wow. So it is really changing. But it's Montgomery County, so you still get strip search when you get in there. Yeah. Right? Well, so as we'll soon as you cross uh, county lines. Exactly. We'll only have masks for another 12 <laughs> years in Montgomery County. It'll be perfect. <laughs> but, but I guess my question is this. Where, do you think that in terms of the remote and hybrid aspect of the workforce, which is the core of what we're talking about today, do you think in whole or in part we're going to get back to where we were? Or do you think that it's going to say, stay substantially where it is right now, where this is the kind of deployment and these are the kinds of issues that are going to be out there six to nine months from now, even a year from now, do you think it's going to go back and it's going to revert back? Or do you think that it's going to uh, not make that much of a change and, and the changes are here to stay? Well, so I think most companies are trying to settle in where's their sweet spot. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, from what I'm hearing, Hearing, it's really this hybrid approach. I mean, there are there were companies pre-COVID that were doing completely remote. They know how to do it. They it worked for them. Right. Um, um, but I think what 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 I'm seeing at least is the sweet spot is really going to be the hybrid approach. You know, where people are for the most part coming into the office at some times and having that flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I think full time return to the office. I, I I hate to say it, but I think that that's I, I don't even hate to say it. I think that that's an obsolete uh, concept. Really? I really think it's going to be, I think it's going to continue to be hybrid. Wow. Um, we've got one here. We're
where it's three mm-hmm. days on, two days off. I think that's right. a really good sweet spot. We, right. we we get together. We have our firm meetings on Wednesday. You know, we have our lunches on Friday. You still build that sort of in-person community. Yeah. That's so, so important. And it doesn't mean you can't do that remotely, but sure. uh, uh, I still think that that's what it is. I think what we're going to see, though, is I think this issue of state-by-state state employment law is only going to get more complicated because, mm-hmm. let's face it, Congress can't pass anything anymore. I mean, we've had some significant <laughs> legislation over the years. Maybe we don't want them yeah, to, yeah, because yeah. when they do, sometimes exactly. they screw it up anyway. I mean, we've got Title VII, Americans with Disabilities right. Act, the age discrimination. Right. I think the days of Congress really being the the, the, the initiator of employment laws is, is over because it's so hard to get those factions together. Right. It's going to be state by state, and, you know, it's going to be red and blue, and, of course, we're always going to have that. Right. So you're going to have employees in these states that, you know, that they may have wildly different laws. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to continue to go down that road. So you think it's going to become more of a state-based animal? Yes. And and I think that that, your point on that is really interesting because even when you think that you know what's happening in your jurisdiction, in your state, no matter how long it's been that way, all of a sudden, it, 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 it is the way it is until it's not. Example, right here in Virginia. This past summer, Virginia enacted so many changes to the laws. The, the, the legislature changed and the laws changed. And let's just talk about uh, employee, employer, employee misclassification issues. Yeah, the independent contractors. That, yeah. was, that was like a nothing burger. Now yeah. all of a sudden it's a brand new cause yeah, of action. Yeah. Potentially a criminal prosecution. I mean, it's yeah. so... And, and, and in the, Virginia, who would yeah, have believed yeah, yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think that without getting too deep in the weeds... My conclusion is with yours that I believe that we are going to be in a partial hybrid. There will be some accommodation and some logistics that employers are going to have to deal with because as more people start to come back into the office, they'll probably need to figure out who's going to be able to get the permanent offices and how many days they need to be there. But I'm with you. I think that what's going to not change is the hybrid work schedule. What is going to change is that state laws are going to become more dynamic the frequency of change is going to increase. And whoever would have thought that Virginia was going to be such a rapidly changing state, things didn't change here for decades. Yeah. And all of a sudden, in one summer, yeah. in one July, yeah. everything changed. Yeah. And it could change again with a new yeah. administration. It could change again. Right. And, 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 and regardless of those changes, it means like the HR department, it means uh, you got to work closely with your employment council. That's a right. shameless plug. But now more than <laughs> ever, used to be, you know, the employee handbook, let's face it, used to sometimes not be on the highest list of priority for sure. HR departments. Right. Oh, we need to dust that off. It's been five years. Uh, uh, yeah. But now, I mean, you really got to look at this thing year by year and because, you know, you could have wildly wrong information in there and somebody's going to take that and, yeah. and it's going to come back to bite you. Yeah, it's not going to be hard to update things, but it's going to be much harder to deal with things if they're not updated. So, so. what do you think about the uh, the new studio doing this here? I, how do we know that Todd didn't fall asleep next I, door? I got to tell you something. All that we're missing are, are the beer taps. <laughs> and then I think we're all set. <laughs> here. So it's almost done. Yeah. Maybe next time we come on the air, you know, we'll maybe have some some uh, some scotch on the table. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, but 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 we won't tell anybody. No, just no, no. We, we've got we've got a lot of great shows. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 John Riggins tapes his show here. Yeah. Uh, we've got um, uh, uh, clients and 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 companies uh, that are using this uh, studio yep. uh, uh, to really up their game and really yep. uh, uh, establish their brand. So yeah. we're excited about yeah, it. Yeah. Government contractors coming in for um, for video based uh, submissions for proposals. And it is really exciting. So Declan, great to see you. Great to be in the new studio. And uh, we'll uh, see you on the next show. Excellent. Great.